Good to see you guys. How you doing, nice man? to see you too. Uh, ben, I'm going to start with you. When sure. you do a movie that has parallels, reflections to what is happening in your personal life, whether it's a movie with someone that you're in a relationship with or when it touches on an issue like alcoholism, do you take that role knowing that members of the press and fans feel like it's an opportunity to ask you questions that we normally would not have? Yeah, I guess, it, well, they'll normally ask you those questions. Anyway. <laughs> I don't. Okay. Maybe you don't, but you know, uh, you're gonna get asked questions about your personal life if you're an actor, no matter what. I've been doing this for 20 years and it always seems to magically come up, you know, whether it was, you know, my marriage or Jennifer Lopez or all kinds of things that had nothing, no bearing on the films I was doing or anything else. I think that's a function of the fact that there's a market for that, that people want to see about, you know, people who are in movies and what their personal lives are like. So I sort of assumed I would get those questions. What I was more interested in was playing a role that represented that experience in the way that I understood it, which is one that is difficult, but not insurmountable. And that is an important distinction uh, uh, to make. I think that the, um, you know, you can't control the press. You can't control what they say about you. Tabloids will just invent stories. People who will sit down with you will mischaracterize what you say. That's just, uh, you know, the tax man takes his price. I mean, that's part of, of doing this job. Uh, what I take roles, what I look for is opportunity to express myself emotionally as an actor in an interesting way so as to generate, you know, catharsis and empathy from the audience. It's funny you mentioned catharsis because I wanted, that was my next question, is just the power of taking a role in a movie. I'm curious as to how cathartic can a role in a movie be? Because you also took all the right steps once you realized you had an issue, you went to rehab and did all the right things. What's the balance of, yes, a role in a movie can be cathartic versus are we blowing this out of proportion and finding the similarities? I mean, I think you have to be careful. You have to be judicious. You can't, you never want to be doing too much because that kind of is off-putting to the audience. They feel like you're trying to sell them something. You do too little and it's sort of uninteresting. So you have to find a balance. Um, yeah, there's, there is catharsis. I mean, I, I, you know, I went through a lot of, uh, I think if you're doing it right, you're, and you're finding parallels within yourself, it can be cathartic. The, the character in this movie, you know, suffers uh, a, a tremendous personal loss that I can't even imagine, you know, and yet trying to imagine that and going through that in a way taught me, you know, even more how important my kids were to me, you know. Um, so I think if you're doing it right and you're generating like authentic emotions, it's going to have an effect on you. It's sort of a therapy, it's sort of like that. You sit there, you talk about how you feel and, and by some nebulous, elusive process, uh, you feel better. Yeah. Guys, I want to shift focus over to you guys. Uh, the best sports movies, we were just talking about this, the best sports movies are not about sports. They're yeah. always about something bigger. If, if it's about sports, they're not doing it right. Can you talk about what it means to have a sport represent not just a game and the number of points and winners and losers, but life as a whole? I think in film, that's most important. You know, if we just want to watch a game, we'll watch the NBA and watch the most elite, you know, mm -hmm. athletes play that game. But in a film, you want to evoke emotion. You want to tell a story. Um, you want to shed, like, transparency on, you know, the life, the lives of those players. And I feel like this film did that, you know, um, it did an amazing job of doing that. And I feel like Gavin O'Connor does an amazing job of doing it with every sports um, story he tells from Miracle and Warrior and now this. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, when it comes to sports movies, it being too much about sports, like he was saying, I could go and go, even not on live TV, I can go on YouTube and look up games. I just think that, uh, you know, there's the movie and like, you know, the vessels are just like the, the sports that kind of sends the messages of what they want the message for you to understand. And you know what I mean? And we making sports movies, you know, we kind of want people to kind of, you know, nobody can always relate to hitting a game when they shot in a basketball movie. People can't always, I know I can. I definitely yeah, can. So, <laughs> you know, but, but you can relate to struggle, you know, addiction, you know, adversity, you know, struggle, you know, and then that's something that we kind of all get in sports and they can take that outside in their own lives. Yeah, I think he's right. Sports are a good metaphor for a lot of things we go through in life. It's difficult, it's challenging, you got to work together. It's, it's sometimes very, very hard. You have to learn to accept defeat sometimes and get back on your feet and do better. Uh, so it's a, it's a very convenient metaphor for telling dramatic stories. Sure. You know, Jack has a watershed moment, two of them in this movie, yeah. where he realizes, 
I got to do something about my life. One is when he pulls up to the bar and the bartender comes out and says, oh, I'll set you up. He already knows your drink. Cool. And the other one is when it's a little bit more serious, you crash a car, he breaks into a guy's house. Did you, <laughs> was there a watershed moment for you? Was there a moment where you uh, said? You know, I have, a, I have a different life than this, this character. This character's, um, you know, principal moment of, of pain is the loss of his child, This is a spoiler. But, you know, and that um, really sends him kind of over the deep end. And, and that's not something that's, um, thank God, and I hope never does happen to me. I think what happens in general with compulsive behavior, with addiction, the people I know who, ha whether it's food or gambling or sex or porn or, you know, I mean, there's just, you know, countless ways that we find to try to, like, make ourselves feel better. Um, I think the universal aspect of it is, yeah, you come to a point where you go, this is not working anymore. You know, this is not give me the satisfaction that it used to and it's making my life worse. I sort of define addiction as when you go from something for pleasure and for fun as a, uh, and then it turns into just trying to uh, numb pain. I wonder if you'll allow me a fanboy question for a second because I've told you before I loved you as Batman. I thought you were a great Batman. Thank I you very you great, much. And well, I'm genuinely bummed that we're not going to see your the Batman. Can I you, think Robert's a great actor. He's, he's going to be great. He's going to be absolutely fantastic. Can you tell me what your the Batman would have been? Uh, I, well, we had a script. It was a whole thing. You know, really what it was for me was, and I like the script. I wrote it with Jeff Johns, who I have a lot of respect for. Um, it just so happened that, like, I had done a couple of those movies, and I kind of lost my passion for it. You know what I mean? I kind of lost my passion for telling those stories. I got interested in telling stories more like this, and it just seemed like, you know, very clear to me that if you're not going to be, if it's not the most important thing in the world to you, you're not going to make a very good movie. A movie deserves to be made by somebody who's dying to do it and can't wait. And uh, that wasn't me at the time, so I moved on. Guys, I genuinely thank you so much for, for everything. Really, it's really you, an honor. Thank you, thanks man. a lot. Congratulations, man. Seriously, thank, thank, you. thank you. Guys, good to see you. What an honor. Uh, there has already been a lot of press and a lot of attention paid to uh, the parallels between what Jack goes through in, the, in this film and then what Ben Affleck went through in his real life. When you guys sign on to this film, whenever you got onto the set with, with Ben for the first day, how much were you aware of what he had been going through at that time? Um, I wasn't that aware of it. Um, I think I heard a little bit prior to it, maybe from like um, my manager, somebody who introduced me to the film and told me the story and gave me a little bit of background, but yeah, it was actually new to me mostly. and but it just made my interest kind of grow and in that he was willing to take that chance. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the tabloids and the, and the press sometimes can just show the bad side of people. And I feel like that was being, I don't know, fed to me for a long time. And it wasn't really until we had our first dinner, Gavin invited us to a big dinner um, when we started the film and kind of filled us in and like, on like, you know, the real thing that's happening. and, and uh, I, I think that's kind of when I really learned this, the actual situation, yeah. you know. Yeah. And Gavin, did that affect you as a director at all, knowing that there were these uh, reflections, that there were these parallels? Um, I, that's part of what was interesting about doing the movie was mm -hmm. the parallels. You know, that once, you know, when we decided to go on the, to do the movie together, um, the, the conversation about confronting the disease, um, had to be handled in a way that was honest and truthful and and uh, vulnerable. Yeah. So, um, and if that wasn't, uh, if that was something that Ben was not comfortable doing, which I would have totally understood, it, it seemed like a moot point to do the movie. Absolutely. But once he was prepared to go very deep and uh, exhume you know, the realities of his own life and put them up on screen, it, um, I knew we were going to be able to do something interesting. Yeah. I'm a big <clears throat> believer that a good sports movie, and I, I'm a sports fan, but a good sports movie should not be about sports. It should always be about something. When you look at the best, when you look at like Field of Dreams and Friday Night Lights and Rocky, yeah. they're about something else. Yeah. What is it about sports movies that, that teach us about things that have nothing to do with sports whatsoever? Well, I think that the thing about sports is that um, it demonstrates the human possibility, the potential of men mm -hmm. and women and what they can accomplish. And whether that's um, 
you know, so the metaphor, I always say like basketball is life in short pants. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, symbolically, what happens on a basketball court with a team and a coach, you can apply those same kind of victories to life. So to me, there are all these parallels about what's inconceivable in sports is also what's inconce inconceivable in life. But the truth is, if you put your mind to something, you can accomplish anything. And I think sports, in, in, in the most, in the most, um, in the highest way, you know, uh, dramatizes that. But to your point about the victories, some of my favorite sports movies are the ones where they lose at the end. Mm -hmm. Moneyball and Friday Night Lights and Rocky, mm -hmm. because a defeat can sometimes be more valuable than, than a victory. What is the most valuable defeat or loss that you guys have had in your life? Oh. <laughs> but, but I should say, like, the trick to these movies, if you look at a movie like Rocky, the, the, the point of Rocky wasn't, the win for Rocky wasn't to win the fight. Right. So the setup of the movie was, I have to go the distance. Right. Right. So it was a win. Yeah, and, exactly. And the, we wouldn't be talking about Rocky if he beat Apollo Creed in the first one, because it was a that would be we would be gagging our. It was because he he accomplished the dream. Him screaming Adrian. Yeah. Was the victory. That yeah. was the victory. Yeah. He found love, and he and you know and 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 he and his dream was to go the distance. So, I think that's why you know when you look at these movies, it's, it's about what's the personal victory, yeah. and the personal victory may not be winning the game. Yeah. You know, one of the things I really loved about this movie that was really refreshing was the fact that it was rated R. And I was actually surprised whenever I heard going in that I heard it was rated R, and then you guys started speaking, and I thought, like, this is how kids talk. Like, yeah. like it's, not, it's not a neutered version. Can you talk about the importance of, and the freedom of having that R rating so you could make it authentic and kind of say what kids say when they're in school? Oh, I didn't speak much. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> So yeah, I, well, I think yes, it's rated R. So we're you know we're able to say pretty much everything. But I also think part of the fun was that Gavin and the writer Brad were very cool with us just kind of putting our own twist on it. You know, putting it in our vernacular, putting it you know making it so that we can say it how we would say it in real life. You know, yeah, there's definitely... I, I was constantly <laughs> asking these guys how would you say it. Well, I had everybody mic'd. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like whenever they showed up for work, we put mics on them. Right. Because I just created a bed of dialogue for each one of these guys. You know, when they were on the bench and practice during the games, I had just a bed of dialogue of them. So so they had to know basketball to start with because you're on a court. If you don't know basketball, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be saying right. the right yeah. things. Yeah. They were always saying the right thing. But, but I was always asking them how, you know, less him, because he didn't say a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of thought bubbles over his head. Yeah. <laughs> when you do speak, man. <laughs> yeah. When he yeah. does speak. Yeah. But I was asking them a lot of times, like, I know this is what was written, but how would you, yeah. with the intention being the same, how would you say it? I explained to him what um, being exclusive was, you know, with girls, yeah. you know, in, in our day and age, <laughs> right. you know, how, it's, how, how to navigate that. Right. So. That's, yeah. yeah. I'm learning a lot. Girls don't talk to me, so I'm learning a lot. Yeah, you're saying, yeah. yeah. Dude, I hear you. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, the original title of the film was The Has Been. That's and, apparent, yes, that's what it was called. And that just to me has, the way back gives me hope. The Has Been sounds, damn, like that just, that sounds tough. Can you talk about the difference that this movie would have been if it had been called The Has Been? Well, it would never have been called the has been. Never. 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 So, I mean, from the first meeting with Brad, when when he had sent me the script, that was like I think the first thing I said is it's, it sounds like a Will Ferrell comedy to yeah. me. Yeah. So, the just the tenor of this movie and it does not reflect. Um, now, the title that we have is not something that we came up with right away either. That was a long process yeah. of with the studio of trying to you know, for all of us to agree on a title. It yeah. was a tough one. And as we wrap up really quick, so much of this movie is about second chances, the importance of getting a second chance. But I want to talk about the importance of giving a second chance, where if you have someone in your life that is going through a struggle, because it can get frustrating, it can get tiresome. Can you talk about the importance of not just on being on the receiving end of a second chance, but remembering that sometimes we have to be the ones that give that second chance? I think, well, in order to remember that, I think, yeah, you constantly have to be able to give yourself a second chance so you have to constantly be practicing that in order to be able to give that to someone else um, and that comes from just being aware that people are constantly changing and people constantly have the opportunity to change so if you can give them that opportunity and be there for that person if you care to be yeah. Um, then yeah that's beautiful if you can do that for them and for yourself yeah. and to add to that I, I would say there's no expiration date on giving a second chance or, or redemption. Um, like when Kobe passed, uh, I kept seeing like, if there's anybody in your life that you know, you've, these, you've had difficulties with, mm -hmm. like go say I love you, go give them a hug. It's never too late to, 
for redemption, for a second chance. Um, and I think you see that pretty clearly in this film. Yeah. Those You're generic questions? Prettiest. That's the hardest part. Is right. Right. Just sitting generic. here, just not Jake like... Yeah. Fox, yeah. The now, are, double slot. are you a direct descendant of the Hamiltons? I'm not. And one of the like most deflating moments of my life is I had the great pleasure of interviewing Lynn. Aww. And he asked me that question, like, jacked up. And I said, no. And you could just see him, like, He's there. always jacked up. That's true. But he, but then he got super deflated. And I was like, do I just say, do I lie? Because But yes, then he would have had all these lied. questions. I could have made it up. Yeah. You'd yeah. be like, I'll tell you at the end of our interview. Yeah, exactly. And I'll tell you in song. And a one. And a two. <laughs> yes. Guys, good to see you. Good you to see you. I'm you. Yeah. These, are so, these are so different from the generic <laughs> ones we just did. Yeah. Do you rap? Do yeah. you freestyle? Yeah. And one, and oh my God. I don't know why this is my like beginning yeah, of every song. Yeah, because that is like yeah. the in, that, that yeah. is like the international sign of Broadway. And we're going, yeah. yeah. And a one, yeah. and, a, and two. a two, and a yeah. Um, so I'm curious. There has been so much press and so much attention paid to the parallels between what Ben th went through in his real life mm -hmm. versus what is happening in the movie. I'm curious how much you knew about what Ben was experiencing whenever you signed on, mm -hmm. and how does that affect how you act across from him, knowing what he's going through. We were super honest with each other. We were very, very honest about what both of us were going through at that time and what we have been through in our lives. So I knew everything. I just lied to him about all of my credentials. No, I, I felt very, um, I'm not a big, um, I don't, I'm not a huge, like, Gossip rag reader. Gossip yeah, reader. I don't, same. I if you tell me, it. then I'll believe you. If Otherwise, it's, if it's in my like news feed on my phone, I catch it. But like sometimes they're like DJ Charcuterie and Captain uh, Tinkertown broke up, and I'm like, who <laughs> yeah. are these people? Yeah. Were I in a coma? Why should I care? And also, you know, you just um, had, at some point you look around, and all of the artists that have been your friends for a really long time are some suddenly famous and then and nothing hap nothing changes between the two of you even though the whole world is sort of going at them and mm -hmm. that's why my rule is kind of like if you tell me then I'll believe you if I read it I'm not gonna yeah not that's gonna. a good rule like and so when I met Ben I just didn't I didn't presuppose anything about him I had you know obviously there are things that come up but I just was like I'll be the judge yeah, yeah. and yeah. I was yeah. floored by how much I adore this guy well, this is a weird junket for us because I don't, I don't ask for, I take pride in not asking personal questions, but that side is, of, of the story is such a big part of this movie, and so I feel like weirdly like tiptoeing across a line that I should not be tiptoeing across. Um, it was interesting because like, because I'm not super up to date on, um, on like celebrity gossip, mm -hmm. I know that we had conversations where after the fact, you know, I might read something and I was like, oh, I didn't know I was treading in that area. But we, but I, I think he's a genuine person and I think if he can sense BS and if you're genuine, then you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about why the best sports movies, mm -hmm. not that they're not about sports, but why you don't need to love, if a movie is done right, you don't need to love sports in order to love it. When you think about... Friday Night Lights and, mm -hmm. and Rocky and Rudy and, Money, Rudy and mm -hmm. Moneyball. That was that's a Joliet movie. Rudy's a Joliet movie. Oh, get out! I'm from Joliet. Yeah, 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 you are. Up hot yeah, top. There's your yeah. high five. You didn't get from that police officer. High five. <laughs> no, never mind. No, no, I no, tried, tried to. That's don't worry about it. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. abroad. It's nothing I'm proud of. Let's not talk. About Fair it. enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. Talk to me about why the best sports movies aren't really about sports. Uh, when you use sports in analogy for the human experience and you do it well, then you have a Gavin O'Connor movie. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> He's like, it's like Rocky and everything Gavin's made. That's basically it. <laughs> and you have the good halftime speech, like, I can't play hockey, but if Kurt Russell was yelling at me, you bet your ass I'm you, going out yeah, there and I'm going to play hockey. Put those skates on. And I'm going to do it. You use skates in hockey, right? A hundred percent. Great. You yeah. do. You do. You absolutely do. With wheels on them. <laughs> But speaking of the best sports movies, some of my favorite ones are when they lose at the end. Rocky and Moneyball, uh -huh. uh, and Bad News Bears, uh -huh. they lose at the, lose at the end. Uh -huh. Talk to me about... Cause so spoiler! Much, yeah, sorry, <laughs> yeah, the 40-year-old <laughs> spoiler alert. Uh, talk to me about... League of the, their own. The most, okay. Yeah, exactly. League of their own. What's the most valuable defeat or loss you've experienced in your life? <laughs> my <laughs> entire career. <laughs> most valuable um, loss or defeat. I... Uh, <laughs> this is not the most valuable. It is A. So dumb. Uh, this is so messed up. I was a very serious musician growing up. Mm -hmm. um, 
classical musician, musician, and I did this like solo contest that mm. we had. It was an IMEA thing in Illinois. I'm sweating. And right we, now. I, yeah, I'm, I'm literally like having flashbacks. And I was playing a marimba piece, and um, I was always trying to get that perfect score, like Nadio Comaneci, which my very um, intense mother always used to talk about because she had a perfect score at the Olympics. <laughs> so I was like obsessed with getting a perfect score, and. I still have these sheets, by the way, and this one um, judge scratched out a 10 and turned it to a 9 at the end of the page. So it was like, you, you go like 5, 5, 10, 10, or something like that, and they literally erased it and changed it to a lower number so I didn't get a perfect score. Uh. I, they probably could sense that I was a little militant child with a chip on my shoulder, and they're like... I'm just gonna knock her down a peg. Oh, they put they they yeah, put taught you they humility. taught me humility, yeah. and I was so upset. I'm pretty sure I had a little ego meltdown at you know 10 years old, and it's the it's basically um, parallel to working in Hollywood in general. <laughs> so it's not a meritocracy, basically. It's a good life um, lesson, but at that, that but moment, that happened. That happened. That's, so that's one. Oh. That's just one of the many. That's the one. I'm, but it all worked out. Look where you're at now. Sure. We're here. Talk to me in 10 years. We'll see if I still feel the same way. It's true. I don't know. I mean, this is going to sound like such platitudes, and forgive me, because the truth is, I honestly believe this super sappy stuff I'm about to say, but every single, like, major rejection, like, I did one season of SNL. They didn't invite me back. That was, like, so... I felt so sad. I felt like your life was I, over. Your career was I, I never going to continue. I know, and I felt like we were having such a nice time. Like, Aww. why don't you want me back? What if I'm that girl? And um, that they're like, uh, we don't like. Her. Oh God. And so I was so sad. But I can look at every single thing, like every heartbreak, every like career rejection, every single moment of my life, and you know, quite honestly, like they've all been part of my becoming and led me to this moment now where I'm I'm super freaking happy mm. and uh, I, I like I have the best husband in the entire world I have a great dog I have the best dog in the entire world like I, I and and I, I oh the baby oh the baby Continue, sorry. Continue. there's a little pit in that guy huh yeah they're just lovers um, and and so Every time I think of like, oh, uh, you know, I didn't get Peter Pan in fourth grade, and like, um, you, you know, all those things like got me to this point. I'm I'm very happy. So yeah. I don't know. It's nice to just you just sort of have to ask yourself at some point what is what is the point for you in mm -hmm. all of this, and. Um, I have an artist's mission statement that I just stick to now, which is I'm here to examine the parts of ourselves that we are not proud of. And every decision I make in my career is, is based on that. Are we really doing that? And um, that is sort of what, what gets you through, I think. Fair enough. They're giving me the wrap. I wanted to say this after the interview. I slept overnight on the ground in Orlando at Star Wars Celebration in order to go to your panel. Oh uh, my god, I'm sweet We and my buddies, we bought pillows at Target and slept oh. in, the, in the line because it would have filled up otherwise. So, so you went to the big reveal? Yes. You were there? Yeah, and so I did, oh and, and at the god. time, I wasn't allowed to get press credentials, so I just went as a, otherwise, Good all my other buddies you. were just strolling in. Well, so you I know they didn't overnight. fly me out there, I flew myself. What? Because they didn't realize that I was as hardcore of a gamer as I actually am. But you're the character! But after that, once they realized I was like, you're not going to get rid of me, they started integrating me. Yeah. But I flew myself there because I was like, I'm not going to miss this reveal. Like, this is the moment, yeah. you know? Oh, anyway, wow. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks really, to meet what an you honor. Too. Thank you so Take much. Take care. So okay. Wait, 